interesting when, when Sally was telling me about these events, she said, you know, the, the, the senior women in our member companies rarely get the opportunity. In fact, I learned earlier, even the women from Deloitte rarely get the opportunity to break bread and chat, you know, catch up with one another. And you guys really value, as we all do, this, this opportunity to have the exchange. So for this last 20, 25 minutes, this is your time. This is your time. So if you have follow-up questions to what I talked about earlier, fine. If you have something else on your mind, you want to pick the brains of the phenomenal women in this room, fine. How can we make the most, from your perspective, of our remaining time together? So I'm going to basically turn this floor over to you. What, is, what do you want to talk about? Questions that are on your mind, comments you want to make? So this has to do with limiting beliefs, and one of the, and I can see it as even if it were true, it's still a limiting belief. So, so I can I can certainly see it in that framework. Um, catalyst research and, and research generally and anecdotally, you know, women in, in the professions and in corporate life talk about the bar being higher for women. So that phenomenon of do I have this, do I have this, do I have this, do I have this, I don't make 90%, I'm not going for it. I'm just kind of, I'm wondering about, you know, how much might it be true that women are, are understanding that bar and what it needs for them as a woman to be accepted and not to be seen as a risk. And for those who go ahead anyway, who say, okay, you know, that may be the reality, but I, I have ambition and I think I can do it, so what tactics could they think about or use when the bar is held higher for that? That they don't make the 90% threshold when someone they're competing against may just you know, get 50%. Okay, so does everybody understand the question? So, so if we're going for a job and we're ambitious, we may not meet 90% of what's on that job description, but we're going to go for it anyway. What are some strategies and tactics that can be employed as we market ourselves in that situation? Yeah? What thoughts do you all have? I've, d I've done something. Oh, go oh. ahead, Lorraine. You need a sponsor or an advocate. you got to have the... Uh, so tell us more about that. How would you approach your sponsor or advocate in that situation? I mean, ideally, um, they can introduce, the, uh, or I guess they can introduce that, um, that awareness that they're holding women to a higher standard of competition for that position. And if that, and if you have already decided to put your name in the ring. How can that sponsor, how can you prepare that sponsor or advocate to be an effective sponsor or advocate for you? What do you do? Well, uh, I'm just, are we accepting as true that the bar is higher? I mean, or are we just thinking <laughs> that the bar is higher for one thing? Because I mean, there's a huge gap between, you know, the men who are 25% qualified, and if you, between 25% and 95%, there's still a lot of space sure. in terms of being more qualified than 25%, even if you're not 90%. I mean, if you're half qualified for the job, you're still twice as qualified as the average guy who's going to go for it. So I'm just wondering, first of all, if, if, if we're accepting as true, and should we accept as true that the bar is higher for women? Well, in my, my interpretation of the question is that it's almost irrelevant whether we accept the bar or not if we are going for it. Is that what you were talking about? We've already decided to go for it. And we may not meet all the qualifications, but we're still going for it. How do we leverage? What strategies and tactics do we use as we put our name in the, the ring and go for it? What, what can we do to help shore up our candidacy? Did I understand that right? Correct. Okay. And, and then the, the catalyst standpoint would probably be it, the research suggest, both catalysts and others, that women are held to a higher. Uh, from, from reporting from the field, we hear women say they're held to a, a higher standard. Mm -hmm. So if that, yeah, But how much of that is here? Yeah. I mean, I guess. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't, I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's still, your question is 
kind of irrelevant. So, right. so even if we're not, if we're, if we don't have the ninety. But I don't think it is irrelevant though, because because if you're believing that you're, I mean, if you're saying that we have to start off with redefining our paradigm, mm -hmm. then we should not be accepting that the bar is high. We should just be accepting that um, you do have qualifications that that will make you useful in that job. You do have things to offer. Um, nobody is ever 100% qualified for anything because if they were, they'd be on to the job above that. Because if you were 100% qualified for the job, you'd already have mastered it. And well, that's should be beautiful, going, but a lot of women don't think that way. So can I say and this? So you'd have to be going for the job, but, but it's about changing the way you think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. It. It's it's changing the way you think. And part of how you change the way you think is instead of focusing on what you don't have, focus on what you do have. Well, don't focus on where you're not qualified. Focus on the areas where you're really going to excel. I mean, most people, you know, there are a lot of, um, okay, I'm really stretching here using athletic, um, I'm stretching for myself just because I'm not all that knowledge about But, you know, there are a lot of um, baseball players who are great pitchers, but they don't hit. You know something, so you don't have to excel at everything. Mm -hmm. You know what? What are you bringing to the team that you will excel at? I think you shouldn't always. You shouldn't really assume, and women do this too much, that it's mm -hmm. only substance that gets the job. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it is not. <laughs> All right, it's what you said about working the relationships and the this and that that helps you get the job. You have to first. You have to first like project the confidence that you want the job and you can absolutely do it, but that's not enough. You've got to actually like have the relationships around where people want to support you because of what they get back and so forth. And I, you know, women tend to look at that like, well, I don't want to play the game. And it's like, no, it's not a game. That's the way business is done. Amen. Yes. It's okay, Did you say it's okay. She, she said it a different way, but it's, yeah. It, it's about thinking that way versus thinking about a qualified job. Yes. Also, the perception is, perception becomes reality if you don't think about yourself as being qualified. And also, there are some situations where if a woman's going to put, put another woman at a very senior level forth, she does want her to meet most of the criteria because she does not want to be put herself on the line because she's in that very vulnerable space herself. Yeah. So the woman, the other woman she's putting forth has to meet a lot of the criteria and she's got to socialize well within that network that, that you talked about. Yes. I think it, you have to start early too. It's about the relationships and it's about, for me, I'm going after a really big job right now. I'll just be open with you all. I'd be the youngest person to ever have it, well less experienced than I should be, and I'm all in. But I've been planning it for a very long time. It's something I'm passionate about, and I know that I'm capable of doing it. Full stop. So I've been using my ally group, and I've been saying, in a succession planning meeting, when my name comes up, what are you going to say? What am I known for? Tell me what my brand is. Tell me what is being said about me. Do you think there's a challenge? Do you think I need to do something different? You told me I needed to get these five experiences. I've had these nine now. Is that enough? And I've had the overt conversation with many of the, my sponsors who happen to be men that my perception in my firm is that men are promoted based on potential and women are promoted based on experience. And that I am here to tell them that I have the potential and they should take the chance on me. And I'm just going for it. And I may not get it. And you know what? That's fine too. But I feel like I've done everything in my personal power by using my network, by asking overtly, will you sponsor me? So when, when it comes up, don't just nod your head. What are the things you're going to say about me that make other people believe that it can be the case? Right, and one thing that you mentioned that I think is so important, do not assume your sponsors and your mentors know enough about you no. to sell you. You give them the talking points. I get, yeah, I gave, them, I gave them the bullets. I emailed them to them and said, this is what I would say. Seriously. And, and here's the facts to back it up. It's yeah. not a bunch of bull, right? Oh, here's what right. I've executed. Here's what I've done. Here's, here's what. People beneath me say I'm known for, like I've taken bits of 360 feedback or whatever, and you know what? It's going to be a long shot, and it would, you know, because traditionally in our firm, you don't get major roles until you're in your 50s. You usually have to be a male, and what the hell? I mean, if I'm going to leave my kids every day, I'm going to go for it. Excellent. Thank you. So. Yeah. <laughs> it is a long shot, but, you know, but I've done everything 
I can do, right? Yeah. And there are a lot of women who say, oh my god, put into bullets my dead why they should, oh my god, that's so braggadocious. How can I do that? That's stepping in your power. This is stepping in your power. It's not this, this, this icky self-promotion thing that we tend to snub our nose at. This is asserting ourselves and knowing that we can do it. We are qualified. We are good. And we need to work the system. We're all in a system, right? So for us not to understand that this is a system at play, I think that was to your point. Yeah. You know. Yes, ma'am. So I, I am seriously not here to be the delayed poster child, but I, I hear these conversations and I feel like I have to thank the women that have gone before me because I don't feel that way. I don't feel I feel I don't feel that women are held to a different standard at Deloitte. I don't know how you guys feel about it. Well, it's been, what, 15 years of when? I just, I don't know. Deloitte's different. You guys, you guys have I don't, been the poster child. I don't child. think it's necessarily women. I think it's an age experience thing. And I think the, the fact that a woman is kind of a kicker, honestly. I don't think it's like the, the reason, if you will. I'm just saying I feel really lucky. Yeah, right no, it's right. these things, because I don't feel that way. That's great. I mean, obviously, it's, nobody's perfect, no firm is perfect, but we don't face that. Well, so is Cat was saying that they think women are perfect. Well, so just break women down. All right. Is that what you want to say? Is that a perception or is it a measured reality? Because I've never, I've actually felt the opposite. It's like being talented and being female actually helps you. Yeah. Yeah, that's how we, that's what we are kind of saying. Yeah. Our firm so much wants to promote women. It's almost the opposite. You're yeah. saying women are held to a higher. Sometimes I feel like we're held to a lower standard because they're they're trying so hard trying so to hard. push women into key roles. Uh, I would have to, you know, kind of add to what um, Emma said. First of all, I mean, generalizing about all women or how all women are general, you know, so we're all trying to unpack that. When we sit with very senior teams, as we sometimes do, and we men or women. Mix. Mix, but he's ever there, so primarily men, but you know, whoever is in those very senior teams. And really establish a level of trust where we really want to understand why does this group look like this and why does it continue to look like this? What's really happening with the fact that there are women on slates? That means there's they've got all kinds of competence, skills, experience, whatever, and they're not fit so that there are some women available and they're not being proportionate to their presence, even its presence on the slates, right? Um, and if we really establish some trust in talking about that, we start hearing about risk, mm -hmm. usually. Risk? That risk. Flight risk? Flight risk? Risk of no. getting the it, it, no. okay. it could be flight. I mean, okay. can we depend on her? Yeah. You know, yeah. that, you know, is she quite as strong? Do we know her quite? as well, um, and is she going to go, you know, is she going to cave, can, you know, can we depend on her? Now we're talking about very senior kinds of positions. There's a lot of pressure, I mean, you know, the economy is what the economy is, you know, the stakes are really high, not easy jobs, and despite all the, you know, the competence, whatever, all the skills, an investment that organizations have put into these women. If they're on the slates, you know, or, or they're, they've had jobs with a lot of different kinds of responsibility. So it's just a little, a slight, just the charm. I'm going to take a chance on her. Mm -hmm. Chance. What the hell is the chance in hiring, you know, in promoting Mary Elizabeth based on how she described herself? So, I mean, Emma, I appreciate mm -hmm. the fact that you brought this up because to the extent that that's operating, particularly at very senior levels. Because, I mean, look at the data. Women advance, we feel great, you know, up to a point, we just keep earning more, and then maybe it starts getting harder. As one woman, a very senior woman in the firm said to me once, it's like the oxygen change. It shocked the hell out of her as this kind of tough cookie that she is, that things were just kind of different. She was prepared for the meetings. They really started before she got there. They started on the golf course or whatever. So no matter how prepared mm -hmm. she was, you know, all that kind of stuff. So not to make this sound awful at the end of all this inspiration with like five minutes to go, but I think Emma, I think Emma or however many minutes. Emma, I thought, Emma, I thought you had raised a really good question in terms of if that's happening. 
What's at strategy? a very senior level. Because right, this is a powerhouse of women here. How do you prepare yourself? Yeah. So Mary and I a, went and I actually went, described. But I went all the, I went all the way. I even said, I understand there's a slate. How many names are on it? <laughs> Three, Mary Elizabeth. Great. Will you choose me? Me over the other two. Uh-huh. Yes. Right, so I'm going around asking. So, and I and, and I want them to say no if it's no. And I told them, look, tell me if it's not. That's yeah. cool. I'm good yeah. with that. Yeah. But I need to hear. You have to. They because you don't know when they get into that situation. I've seen it happen. They'll choose the other person. Yeah. Who is they going to spend safer. their reputation? Capital That's right. Yeah. And I said, are you ready to spend the capital? What's the interaction in the group? You may be wonderful. So, and maybe this isn't the circumstance everybody is facing. But, but the numbers don't lie. No, they don't. But, it, but it, and in mm -hmm. aggregate, the numbers don't lie. Now we're talking about individuals, us, right? So, um, you know, so what, what do you do about it? So it helps to be prepared. And one thing that somebody on our board of directors talked about in terms of when he sponsored people was making sure they got the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard thing to kind of um, ask about. I mean, you can ask about it, but yeah. to make sure that you're going to have the support and latitude when you get there, because you're not going to be able to do everything successfully. So, um, do you have that benefit of the doubt? And he talked about when he sponsors somebody, um, a money back guarantee. He'll take them back. If it doesn't work out, mm -hmm. they they are going to have a really good job to continue with it. Maybe there's something sad about thinking, you know, I need a fallback position. But that's part of having real sponsors and real benefit of the doubt. I think you also remove the fear. So I even said to my sponsors, so the worst thing that could possibly happen is you take a chance on a, a younger leader, and I fail. And guess what? I failed a lot before. Won't be the first time. But guess what? A lot of other people that we put in these positions fail too. And at the end of the day, we move these people around like chess pieces. So does it really matter in the end? No, it doesn't. Right? Because I think they're afraid you put it forward, it'll have so much spotlight, and then if it goes wrong, oh, you know. But if it goes wrong, it goes wrong. Things go wrong every day. Big deal. Move on to the next. And oh, okay, maybe it isn't that scary. Yeah, no, I it isn't. really appreciate how you got yeah, it out so and so talked about it to say to people, you know, to make it safe. Delight you know, like people are, what are you laughing about? <laughs> <laughs> She's way more controlling than that. <laughs> <laughs> She's admiring your ability to just let well it go. go. <laughs> and I've decided I'm just not senior enough. To, like, <laughs> that's my problem. I'm too junior. I now hate those issues. I yeah. actually say is exactly as you're thinking. Uh, let's just say the what corner pocket over there. What is your problem then? Do you have? I mean, what are your challenges? <laughs> we're, we're away from our families. You know? yeah. We have life balance. I mean, how do you? I mean, you have. Three kids. I mean, if you're talking kids. about well, men on the men it, on the job, from my perspective, who are there five days a week, like their mind is in it 100 percent. And then for me, I have three children at home and, and the balance. And, and women self-select out for this reason. But our yeah. our role. Yeah. I mean, our no matter what anybody says, I mean, I have guys. Yeah come to me at work and say, what's with this women's initiative? I face the same challenges as, as a dad. I'm like, bullshit. Yeah. You don't. Because the, the letters come home from the preschool expecting the mother to give the class coffee, yeah, never the do. father. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's changing slowly. But it's changing slowly. Yeah. So that's our, that's try our challenge. I'm, I'm try in the car having, telling my kids you know, to be quiet while I'm on a car. Try, try <laughs> it. And you know, even though it's happened to your child and you answer that yeah. I identified yeah. you as the only mom that wasn't at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you have a comment over here. You know, that's been happening for a lot of years. My, my, my youngest is now 23, right? Okay? And so I didn't show up for the, the B play. I mean, I will never live that down. I did not show up for the first, my daughter had the lead in the B play. And I did not show up for the first 10 minutes because I was in a client meeting. And my husband was there, though. Yeah. And, and so, you know, it is about designation, like somebody's got to be the kid's champion for right. every day. Yep. And you have to push it back on the school because you gotta tell the school. Like I worked in a town where there was thirty women who worked and the rest of us the rest of them didn't work. We called ourselves Western women who work. <laughs> Three <laughs> <audience. And> there <laughs> reality <laughs> show. <laughs> thirty of us who worked. Okay? And so we we joined we joined into a club because we were like, okay, so the 
we had a problem with the school. They actually actually wanted me to be president of the PTO, and I was CFO of Fast Company Magazine. Then we were growing at like a rate of you know, 60 percent. I'm like, do you understand that I'm there till in the North End till midnight every night, growing this magazine? So what you have to do is you have to advocate to the school, and you have to train them because you they are still in that model, and there is no family model anymore. That's mother, father. There's you know there's Divorced parents. Oh, yeah. Trust everything. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. My school changed because my husband stays at home and he wanted to be the room mom. Right? He was ready to sign up to be the room mom, but they asked for the room mom and he raised his hand. He goes, Well that's a shame because I was gonna be the room dad, but I guess you don't need those. Mm -hmm. Boom. Mm -hmm. Right? Next year, room parents, room parents. <laughs> <laughs> like <to> room parents. <laughs> <laughs> I <can> volunteer. <laughs> but you know, you just gotta break it all around. Any other thoughts on how to go? I, I just want to do more elaborate thoughts on writing down your vision. Yeah, I like that concept. But you know how companies do it? Here's our vision statement. They spend millions of dollars. They get committees upon committees. They cascade. They get employee employee. Has anybody been through a visioning process? Oh my God. I mean, oh my lord. That was the vision. They spent two point five million dollars in writing a vision. Actually, the model is very much the same for your life vision. You know, you take you, you talk about it as if it's already happened. You talk about it in very specific terms. You be sure you cover the multiple aspects of your life. So spirituality, community, career, family, love, you know, relationships. And you you talk about it in, in very tangible yet aspirational terms. It has to be a BHAG, right? Big, hairy, audacious goal. Not really that achievable in the today. It's gotta be enough of a stretch that it, it sort of moves you in a direction. There are a few, I mean, there are, there are lots of resources out there that help you figure out how to craft a vision. I particularly like one that's in a book called Life Entrepreneurs. Has anybody heard of it? Christopher Gergen and David uh, Van Rappen. Uh, Greg Van Rappen. They, in that, they give, actually give a sample of what a vision statement can look like and give you some instructions as to how to go along. I actually help my students go through this. Um, we do it, we, we actually have a six week course that we do where we actually come out with their Myers-Briggs type. They do strengths finders and come up with their strengths. We do a values exploration, they come up with their values, they do a vision for their life, and, and I help them map it all together. And I have instructions that I've done for them, and if you'd like me to shoot it out to you all in an in a email after this, if, you know, Sally has your um, email addresses, I'd be happy to do that as well. But basically, I mean, my, my vision is two paragraphs. And, you know, it, it is amazing what kind of a decision-making lens that vision can be when you realize kind of in your end state, in your ultimate life situation, the kind of environment you want to be in, the kinds of, the types of activities, not necessarily specific to the end, but the, the kind of life you want to lead, all of a sudden, certain career paths just fade away. Certain places where you might live just fade away. Certain relationships just fade away. It, it becomes an incredibly focused kind of, or a focusing mechanism. Just like a company vision. Susan, I just out of curiosity, why did you leave the corporate world in the textron role that you had? I, um, I actually got to that senior level, and over my six years in that role, I literally started to feel like I was empty. My job was no longer filling me up. And um, I think part of it was that, you know, one, one of my core values is uh, freedom. It's freedom of expression, freedom of movement. It's just like, and I felt so constrained Sort of the higher I went up, I felt more and more constrained. It was omni-available, it was always on. It was at, at sort of the sacrifice of everything. And, you know, in the back of my mind, I, I had this other thing that I always wanted to try. And so finally I was like, you know what? I need to pull the trigger. I need to stop being a hypocrite, frankly. So that's where I was at. How are we doing, Sally? Well, we are out of time. It doesn't mean we have to end. I'll leave it up to you guys, but we are uh, at the 30 mark. Um, keep it going if you want. Your party. Do you have additional comments, questions?
Okay, so actually, just just for future reference, what are just start rattling off some things that are weighing on your mind? The balance issue, or you know, is balance even a should we even be using that word anymore? Um, <laughs> yeah. what, are the, what are the things that weigh on your mind? Guilt. 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 That's the website where we shop. <laughs> What are the things would you like to talk about in the future if there were, you know, for planning, future planning? Just so start shouting them out. You guys just want to talk to So how much do you think, um, so when I made manager at Price Waterhouse in like 90, they gave us the Meyer Friggs. And they gave all the partners in our group the Meyer Friggs. Turns out 85% of the partners were ENT. 85%. And then in the manager class, there were four of us out of 25. That were ENTP? Yes, and I was the only female that was ENTP. Now, can you all use that in J? Yeah. 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 It's the NTJ. Yeah. 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 No, no not, no, this not there. Oh, this is, oh, this is expert strong. witness people. It's a little different. Restructuring bankruptcy expert witness. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was totally. So now, all four of us made the partner. But then my mom's a psychologist, and I went home, and I was like, oh, this is really fascinating. Like, I'm going to make it. Right. <laughs> she said to me, I forget what the percentage is, but she's like, do you realize that box is like, I don't know, 80% or 90% male? So I sort of, over the years, have been tainted by this sort of view because I looked around and really realized, like, personality is, I don't know that it, I mean, there's women who self-select out because they just aren't comfortable with that, you know, whatever, it, it, what it takes to make it at the senior level. You kind of got to be outgoing. You got to be able to handle change and not get stressed. You got to be able to, you know, there's just a lot of those traits that I don't find in as many women. So then you look around and say, okay, am I fighting a losing battle over 20 years of my, you know, 17 years as a leader? trying to keep women in my field and f having them self-select out even with me like really trying to get as many as I can. I have a few, but they're pretty much ENTPs. <laughs> Once I find them, I'm okay, I gotcha. <laughs> Do you think the women over 45 are still self-selecting out? Well, at some point, if you don't stay in the game, you know, it's a little hard to come back. I mean, I took a woman recently who'd kind of been out for a while. She got divorced and she had some issues and this, but she kind of has that drive and that, you know, confidence and able to sell and sort of everything that it takes. And so I think she'll make it. She's coming back in like early 50s. But I think it's rare. Interesting. And drive and confidence are the two attributes you just cited as reasons why she'll probably make it. I think she will. Yeah. Well, but there a lot of really young, talented women, like, I desperately tried to get them to stay, and it was always family issues. <laughs> or fear of having to sell, or fear of, you know, just couldn't get that confidence level you need to really make it. Do you think there's something, I was going to ask, do you think there's something cyclical in that? I was sharing with my table earlier that I, in my star group at Ernst & Young, there were 13 girls who were very good friends, started as staff or senior, I'm the only one still in the workforce. We all have advanced degrees, PhDs, masters, whatever. I'm the only one still working outside the home, I'll say, because the hardest job is, of course, working at home. We know that. <laughs> but um, when I talk to them, the reflection they give back to me is that, well, my mother worked, and I didn't like it. And so I'm going to be there for my kids. And so when I reflect back to my life, my mother also worked. She was a pharmacist and was gone, and I didn't like it. That's true. I didn't like it. And so I'm wondering if it's less about personality or flexibility or the workplace and more about a cyclical cycle in generations where we tend to bounce back and forth. And that's why I've sensed in the last 10 years or so, in my personal opinion, I feel that women leadership and progression has massively stalled. Yes. I'm not negative about it, but I feel that we are at best treading water. Yes. And I also mentor hundreds of women. I'm like the poster child for partner with small kids. I mean, they're in my office like, Rotation, well, right? They Which take is great. Out too much. Yeah, but well, yes, not but to, not to not to sort of pile on your yeah. theory here, but I loved being a latchkey kid. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I loved it. it. Right. The, the freedom, freedom of being a latchkey kid was awesome. Or maybe oh, yeah. it's the freedom that scared him. I don't know what. All I know is that from talking to my sample of twelve, they're at home. 
because they're boomeranging back from what their parents right. did. Well, actually, there, there, there is a lot of research and discussion now around Gen Y, right? Yeah. And, and that these, this, this new generation coming in is demanding a whole set of different circumstances right. than we ever could have dreamed of. They're going into it saying, hey, I'm not willing to sacrifice family life. Right for a job. It's a completely different mindset. And it's wreaking havoc on the boomers who are trying to manage these folks. Because yeah. yeah. now you've got very different mindsets going on. That generational gap that we're reading a lot about. So actually, I do believe it's cyclical. I do too. And I do believe it's actually going to get worse before it gets worse. I, it's, I do too. And because people are going to be off and they're just going to say, you know what? I don't want to climb that ladder. I just as soon stay down here and I want to have a full life. I mean, do you know how important community is to this generation? Oh my yeah. gosh. I'd like to put a plug in for the Deloitte. Because I think what the real issue is, is that companies need to change. It's not about fitting women into the cookie cutter yeah. culture of the 1950s industrial manufacturing mm -hmm. format. Amen. It's about how do we adapt our corporations so that we can all get work done. And, and Deloitte's lattice framework, I don't know if that's helped so, you at all, so but I, um, it sounds great. And, and I think, we, I think it, it talks to just our perspective, our firm's perspective of wanting us to succeed. I don't think any of us subscribe to that methodology per se, but we all have found our way to survive and to, to thrive in what we do. It's all different, like the way you do it, the way Beth does it. Wait, it does it is different, but our firm is supportive of it. When? Yeah. So I had been actually at Price Waterhouse and started having a family. Went part time. I was working three to four days a week, sort of depending on the project, and then resigned because um, we were acquired by IBM. And I just didn't want to do that, and um, and stayed home for four years. I was teaching at Stern, but I was basically home for four years. I had a couple offers to return back to work when I decided to go back, and I thought I couldn't go back into consulting. I interviewed at Deloitte. Deloitte offered me, literally, the woman who made me the offer said, there's no way you're going to go from being home full time to working five days a week in this. She said, how about if you come back three days, four days, and then we work it out from there. And I worked three days a week for a year, and then four days a week for another year, and then went full time. There's not a lot of firms, and of course, I've left a lot. Because you're probably working five and uh, yeah, getting paid well, for three. Yeah. <laughs> I do, I, I have to say, I'm in a booze now, and I was telling the ladies, out of 258 partners, less than 15 are women, okay? It's bad, it's really bad. And I had no idea walking in the door how profound a difference that is on a day-to-day -day basis, because at Deloitte, I never even thought about it. You know, I mean, I just never even thought about the fact that I was a woman, that I had children, that it was different in any way because there were so many really cool women that I shared the experience with. <laughs> yeah. And you, did, you didn't feel penalized for the three-day-a-week or four-day-a-week structure, which in a lot of environments, man, yeah. well, you can get it, you might be able to negotiate it, and then you've got the black mark on your head. Right? That's absolutely right. Yeah. So I, I have to share a really quick story, because you mentioned Shelly before. And she spoke at one of our events in Iowa. I mean, that had to be, what, eight years ago? Yeah, and I caught her all the time. I caught her all the time. Yeah. ripped her off. She literally <laughs> changed my life that day. If you ever speak to her, you can relate this to her. Because I was a manager at the time, and I had a newborn and a one-and-a-half-year-old. And I was at that kind of pivotal point saying, how the hell am I going to do this? And I was staffed on this high-burn project out of town. And she came in to speak to us, and at the end of it, someone asked a question, oh, I understand you have four kids, how do you do this? And she paused, and she said, you know, you have to love what you do, because you're gonna love your kids. Even before they're born, you love your kids. And I'm saying, I do, I love my kids. <laughs> she said, but if you don't love what you do, you're always gonna have this guilt. Mm -hmm. Not that we don't have the guilt occasionally anyway, but, and I sat there, and I was like, I love what I do. I'm doomed. I'm doomed to this life. But I think that's really important. You have to find the thing that you love, you're passionate about, or else you're never going to feel right. Okay. 
Okay, All you're right. so awesome. Okay, so <laughs> here's, here's, here's her model. Here's her model. Forget the word balance. It's bullshit. Yeah. It's called equal pulls of passion. Yeah. Equal yeah. pulls of passion. She actually had more kids as she moved up the ranks at, in her firm. She said that, you know, she absolutely loved her job and she kept her family sort of as an equal pull of passion. And she said, not that it was ever easy. Not that it was ever easy, but they were two loves of her life, and she found a way, right? And so, you know, it's and that that whole that stayed with me, and I mean, it made it way, it's made way into the article because it's like, you know, this balance connotes one image, but equal pulls of passion. It's like, yeah, and sometimes one's going to be pulling a little bit more than the other, but it's it's that yin and yang. Yeah. And I think you have to be open and communicate about what you want. So. And, in, and sometimes your companies in, in trying to help you make assumptions that aren't necessarily true. So I had come back from having my second child from maternity leave and I came back and my boss said, you know, we know you're easing back in so we want to put you on a local job and make it easy for you. And I said, no, put me on the biggest, hairiest, toughest <laughs> job out there. I'm going to make partner. That's what I'm going to do. And they were like, no, I mean, but don't you want to like go slowly? I'm like, no, if I'm going to be gone, I'm all in, all in. But they were trying to be helpful, but they didn't understand what my personal ambition or drive was, right? And so I think you have to be open about it because people are on the surface, I think, trying to be helpful, but they're not necessarily sure how to negotiate all the time, especially if they haven't had, just had a child, right? <laughs> if it's a man and doesn't know what that might be or like or what have you. But, okay, well, we're losing a few people. Yeah, I think we'll call it a night. Um, but Susan, I want to thank you. <laughs>